Turn with me, if you would, to the, Mark, uh, to the book of Mark. Mark chapter, uh, chapter 2. And while you're turning to Mark chapter 2, uh, I just want to talk to you for a couple moments here. Uh, starting out, I have been <clears throat> on a series. The past series I was on was on prayer and the importance of prayer. And we talked about prayer and that in the life of a believer, prayer is extremely important. Without prayer, uh, we're powerless. Honestly, somebody wants to understand what God wants with their life, hear me out for a minute. To understand what God wants for your life, you have to have a life of prayer. You have to have a life of prayer. Now, somebody might say, well, I, you know, I want to hear from the Lord, so I need to get in the Word of God and read the Bible. I do agree that getting in the Word of God is important, but that's not completely where you're going to hear the voice of God. Now, it is God's Word, and we need to read the Bible, and that's important. Scripture tells us that. But there's another part to that that cannot be excluded, and that is our life of prayer. On the same hand, I know some people who think that it's all about prayer, and they never get in the Word of God, and they think they hear from God, and I'm just telling you, that's a dangerous place to be because the Word of God and prayer go together, hand in hand. Just like a telephone, you got the earpiece and the mouthpiece. Earpiece is what you listen. That's the Word of God. We listen to what God has to say. The mouthpiece is where we speak. And when you have the earpiece and the mouthpiece, there's a conversation that goes on. And God speaks to us in a conversation. <clears throat> there are some people, they never know when to shut up, right? They talk and they talk and they talk and they talk and you know what I'm talking about you've been around them and you can never get a word in edgewise there is not a conversation going on here a lot of com uh, no communication there's a lot of words coming at you but there's no communication it's it's just a lot of words <clears throat> and so we have to understand there's times when we need to get along with God we need to just spend time with God in prayer and, and there's been times where God has spoke to me in prayer in a way that he hadn't spoke to me any other time. Now, it's not minus the Word of God. I get in the Word of God, I study it, and there's times where I read and I'm looking for answers, and I read and I'll go, Lord, what are you saying? I'm just not understanding what I need to do here. And then I go to the Lord in prayer in desperate pursuit of the Lord to understand what it is that he wants me to do. And it's in that moment of prayer, God slides certain scriptures together that I've read and studied that boom, and I see the picture and I'm going, thank you Jesus, and he speaks to me through prayer, not minus the word of God, but he speaks to me through prayer, and if you're living a life that you're just being a student of the word, you're reading the word and, and studying the word, that's amazing, but you're only halfway there, all right, you got to do the other half. You gotta have a life of prayer. You gotta be trusting the Lord, having that conversation, that communication with God. That's really important. Well, now, and we've been in the book of Mark <clears throat> and looking at this passage. Well, we're gonna continue the passage, and we started last week on a new series called Devoted. And it just continues from this whole subject of prayer, but it's about being devoted and how important it is. Last week, I talked to you about being devoted. And that being in being devoted, we need to be loyal, right? There need to be a loyalty that we have in our devotion to the Lord. And if you remember, Jesus had gone in the synagogue and there was a man that uh, was a man who had what? That came to Jesus. You remember? He was diseased with what? Leprosy. Now, again, I state that the different things that Jesus healed people from in the scripture is always a metaphor of the things that we need to be healed by in our life. Blindness, God opens the eyes of those that are lost to see the grace of His redeeming power. Those that are immobilized because of a life of choices, of bad choices, that are paralyzed, God raises them up off the bed and gives them the ability to go forward and to move forward and not be paralyzed by whatever it's been that they've been paralyzed by, whether it be a life of sin or bad choices or whatever, God brings freedom from that. Leprosy, in this particular case, was a horrible, horrible sin, uh, or a horrible, horrible sickness, rather, that could represent the most vile of sinners. Right? 
the, the, it'd be the, the sickest of the sick. It would be the criminal uh, of the criminals. It would be the worst of the worst. The people that nobody else wanted to even have anything to do with. Jesus reached out in the middle of all his sickness, his leprosy, and he touched them. That's amazing. God calls us as believers to pursue that same thing in our life individually and as a ministry I was sharing with the deacons just this last week we have our shirts that say no perfect what no perfect people allowed right now either that's a motto or it's a truth if it's a motto I said to the deacons we just need to take shirts if it's just a motto we need to take them and burn them get rid of them because I don't want to just be somebody that says something but we don't live that that needs to be who we are. We need to live that. We need to mean that. We need to embrace that. That's who God wants us to be, is people that are loving all men and women to the feet of Jesus. And all those that are willing to pursue knowing Jesus, those who want to come to the feet of Jesus, we need to facilitate the ability for them to do that, right? Would you agree with me? Okay, at least three or four of you do. I hope the rest of you do as well. Thank you. Here's what I want you to see. We have a story here, and look with me if you would, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 2 of Mark. And we have a story here where Jesus, it says, and when he, Jesus, returned uh, to Capernaum after some days. And remember now, when Jesus healed the man with leprosy, after he healed the man with leprosy, he told the man to go to the what? Okay, to go to the temple or to go to the priest. And the reason he had to do that is because he was unclean and there had to be this, this cleansing process of the, the, the priest had to declare this man is clean. It's just the way it worked. But the man didn't do what Jesus told him to do. He went out and he publicized his healing to everybody, and so, I mean, you know, if you're looking at it from the, from the guy with leprosy's point of view, you'd say, how could you keep that quiet? How could you not want to tell everybody, right? Looking from his point of view, but looking at it from Jesus' point of view, the man broke loyalty to Jesus. Jesus asked him to do something, and he didn't do it, and because of his decision not to do what God told him to do, it altered the, the trajectory of Jesus' ministry from that day forward. Now no longer could Jesus go in freely into the cities and to preach and to teach. The Bible says that he had to go out into the desert places and people went out and they found him out in the desert places and they pursued him. So with that in mind, here we go. Look what it says in verse 1. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, he was reported... That he was at a home. <laughs> Jesus tried incognito, under cover, to get into a home and not be recognized or noticed. When we lived out in California, I remember <clears throat> there were quite a few times where my dad would come home and see California is right there near Hollywood and all that. And my dad would say, hey, I just saw, and he would name off some movie star that he just saw. I'm like... You just saw whoever it was, you know, Tim, uh, I don't know. Um, no, no, I knew you would think that, and that's what's going on in my head. Anyway, a little further back, though, and I, I can't, that's why I can't think of the guy's name, but he's a comedian. Uh, but anyway, um, and so he saw him one day driving down the road, and he said, yeah, so I'm driving down the road. I'm like, really, where at? You know, and he told me, and he said he was driving along this old beat-up car. Old beat up car, what do you mean? I mean, like, he's got all kinds of money. You'd think he'd be in a limo or something. He said, oh, no. Said, movie stars will ride around these old beat up cars because they don't want anybody to know it's them. And nobody's going to look inside that old beat up car to see who's in there. They look in the fancy cars to see who's there. So they go incognito and they move around so that they can go places and do things. And here Jesus is going into the city, goes in this home, and then it's published around it's reported that Jesus is in this home and it says in verse 2 and many were gathered together so that there was no room no more room not even at the door and he was preaching the word 
to them. And here's what we find. Jesus in this home, now this home is so pressed full of people that there's not even any standing room. I mean, it's like wall-to-wall people, and it's so much so, it's right out the door of the house. Well, we find there's a man that's uh, is a paralytic, and he's laying out in the street. And there's four guys that come along and they go, Hey, you know what? If we get this man to Jesus, he could heal him. Now, I have a feeling this man probably was a friend, somebody they knew. And so they went and all four guys went out and they grabbed up this guy's bed, one in each corner of the bed, and they started going to the house. And they thought, this is great, man. We're going to get to Jesus and he's going to touch him and he's going to be healed. And they start approaching the house and they're going, Wait a minute. Which house is it? There's so many people. I mean, it's like it swarmed around the house like a bunch of bees around a beehive. and They're probably thinking, how in the world are we going to get him to Jesus? So they devise a plan. In this passage, it says that they go up onto the rooftop of the house. They start peeling the roof apart in order that they can lower this man down at the feet of Jesus. Now, you might say, that's cool. That's awesome. Not if you own the house. (laughs) If you own the house, you're probably pretty ticked about this point. Hey, wait a minute. Don't tear up the roof. We'll, We'll find a way for you to get in the door, but please don't be tearing up my house. No. They rip the roof apart, and they lower this man down to Jesus. And Jesus, he looks at this man. He looks at the men who lowered him down. And because of their faith, Jesus says some remarkable words to him. He says in verse number 5, And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting around there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And what's that next word? I love when that word's there. What is it? And immediately. I love that. Jesus rebukes them without even hesitating. And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins, here's what I'm going to do. And so, I just add that little thought, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what he did. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. Now, what does that mean in order that you could see? He told the man his sins were forgiven. They said there's nobody that can forgive sin but God himself. He doesn't have the power or authority to do that. Jesus said, okay, you know what? Let me show you what kind of power and authority I have. I'm going to tell this man who's a paralytic to get up and to walk. Look how much power I got. I got power to do that. I got power to forgive sin is what he is saying. He told the man to get up. And what does it say happened in verse 12? And he rose and what? Say it. And what? In verse 12, and what? It's on the screen. He arose, he rose, and what? There you go. Immediately. I love that word. No hesitation. Without apprehension. Without waiting. Immediately picked up his bed. And went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. I want you to take this story for just a few moments, and I am going to preach a message just simply based on talking about devotion. I'm going to, here's pretty well the title of the message Warning. The title of the message is Warning. Beware. Here's what we have to beware of. We have to beware of the fact that 
there's three things the scripture tells us to beware of as a believer, as a person who's a follower of Jesus. If we are going to be devoted to follow Jesus, we have to understand that there are pitfalls and there are things that will get in our path, will get in our way, that will destroy our devotion to the Lord. Do you understand that? Hey, it's great that you have certain things you want to do in your life. But if you aren't a realist and understand that in your pursuit after the things you want to do in your life, that there's not going to be opposition that's going to try to discourage you or to tear you down, then you are walking blindly and are only going to fall to defeat. I ride a motorcycle. Been riding a motorcycle since I was approximately 13 years old. Rode dirt bikes jumping stuff and doing all kinds of things when I was just young. I've rode bikes my whole life. I have a motorcycle now. I ride my motorcycle. I've had only one close call, I'm saying, since I've been on the road. <laughs> I've had several little incidents when I was younger because I was young and dumb. But, <clears throat> but on the road, I've had only one close call. When I was approximately 22 years old driving down the road, I was going down a road, going down a street in town, and a car decided it was going to back out on the road when I got really super close to them rather than, you know, I thought they saw me. I assumed they saw me. I thought everything was fine, and they pretty well waited until I was within feet of them, and then they started backing out in the road. And I did everything I could, hit the back brake, slid the bike kind of sideways, got right to the bumper. I think they heard the wheel squealing. They hit their brakes. Thank God they did. As soon as I got to their car... My bike's sliding sideways to it. I let off the brake and the back end whipped the other direction. And I bet my leg was this close to hitting their bumper. Suzuki 750. That's not a little bike. That's a big bike to be sliding sideways. And I thought, oh, man. Now, let me just simply say this. Why is it that I have been able to be successful in not having any wrecks and all? Is it because everybody around me drives perfect? No way. The reason is, is because I have learned that in riding in a motorcycle, I have to be, have this warning that's going off in my head all the time, saying, beware, that person who's pulling up to the road right now is probably not going to stop. And when they don't stop, here's what I'm going to do to avoid an accident. And my mind is constantly having to watch everything going on to avoid any situations. Now, don't get me wrong. By the grace of God, I haven't had any wrecks. I'm not going to take full claim that it, it's me. It's not. God has protected me and kept me safe. And God has given me the wisdom to understand. I've always got to be aware of the obstacles that want to take me out when I'm riding a motorcycle. You can never assume that everybody sees you. You've got to pretend you're invisible all the time. So when I'm coming up to a road, I think in my mind, what can I do to make sure that they know I'm here? If I think that they don't know what's happening, I'll honk my horn, I'll rev my bike up, I'll pull the clutch in, rev it up, I'll do whatever I have to to get their attention because I don't want to have an accident. Hear me out. If you're going to be a devoted follower of Jesus, you have to walk your life with the same attitude. The Bible says that as a believer, we are to walk circumspectly. You know what that means? Always aware of the danger. Always aware of the danger. So what are the dangers? There's three things that we need to be warned of. You ready? I'm going to give them to you in brief, and then I'll break them out in the message. First... We have to beware, we have a warning to beware of, of the world, its influence. We'll get into that more here in a minute. Second, the flesh. And what the flesh will do to cause us to lose our devotion to the Lord. And third, the devil. The world, the flesh, and the devil. They're all three in opposition to our devotion to the Lord. Do you realize that? Now, let's look at it from the picture of this, of this man, of these four men in this paralytic. 
we find that they get devoted. They get determined to decide. They're going to take this man. They're going to do ministry. They're going to see God do some amazing things in this man's life. And boy, they can't wait to watch it happen. And they know that Jesus can do it. And they all grab his bed. And they're walking to the house. And now the world's in their way. What looked like a brilliant plan and a great idea, if there was no opposition, this would be great. This would be smooth sailing. If I don't have to fight any battles, that would be really nice. If I don't have to work my way through the crowd, that'd be really nice. If I don't have to listen to the voice of opposition and people tell me, Hey, get behind me. It's not your turn. Get out of the way. If, if I didn't have to listen to all that, then it would be a lot easier to stay devoted to whatever God wanted me to do. But when opposition comes from the world, and by the way, when I say world, I'm not just talking about lost world. I'm talking about even the world of believers, those that are in the presence of Jesus. They can cause you to lose your devotion if you're not careful and if you're not always prepared to know what's going on because you have an enemy that wants to take you down so here's what's happening these four men get there they can't get in everything's terrible and they decide they're going to devise a plan because they are truly devoted to see this man get healed and so they climb up on the roof I don't know about you but I have had to change uh, shingles on a roof before and there is nothing that I dislike, there's not too many things I dislike anymore than having to put a 50-pound bag of shingles across my shoulders and start going up a rickety ladder to get the shingles up on the roof. A 50-pound bag. I can't even imagine a man that's been a paralytic and he's been laying there and a paralytic, I'm sure, isn't a little guy. I doubt he was a skinny little dude because people that move around and their joints work and they can run and do all that the food processes better and they don't gain weight as easy but all you do is lay around because you're paralytic when you eat it just kind of like it's there right so he wasn't a little guy i doubt and now they've got to climb up onto the roof what devotion is it that they are willing to climb up on the roof and finally once they get up there they start peeling the roof back and tearing it apart to get him down to jesus do you see the devotion here? First warning. Hear me out. Warning number one. Beware of the world. Beware of the influence of the world. Beware of the voices of the world. Beware of the, of the, of the world that wants to push you out and cause you to feel like you're somehow a second-class citizen. My friend, I want you to know something. Your devotion to the Lord has to be sure, has to be determined, and it cannot allow the world to influence your ability to stay loyal and devoted to the Lord. And if you don't understand that those oppositions will come, you're only going to get knocked off your devotion to the Lord. The second thing is the flesh. Warning of the flesh. All right, first, before I go to the flesh, let me, let me share a verse with you. Um, out of Luke chapter 12 and verse 11 and 12. I'll give you this verse real quick. Luke chapter 12, verse 11 and 12, and then we'll come back. We're going to flip-flop a little bit, so you, it's however you want to do that on the screen, okay? But everybody else, you just follow with me, and if you just want to listen, that's fine. Luke chapter 12, verse 11 and 12 says, And when they bring you before the synagogue and the rulers of the authorities do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say for the Holy Spirit would teach you in that very hour what you ought to say one of the things is people say well you know when I have opposition from other people I don't know what to say I don't know what to do when the voices of, of other people try to influence me to make decisions one way or the other I don't know what to do pastor and I say, you know what? As a devoted believer of Christ, you need to rely on the Lord and God will give you the words to say when it's time to say something. You've got to trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him. He'll direct your path. 
He'll guide you. He'll give you the ability to see and to understand what it is that needs to be said in the time that it needs to be said. So in this whole area here of, of beware of the world, I want to take you to a passage in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 and following. Listen to what it says. Matthew chapter 15, uh, Matthew chapter 7, rather, verse 15 and following. It says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravish, ravenous wolves. Do you see the picture here? You can't help but go back to the children's uh, storybook, right? The big bad wolf, or, you know, the uh, uh, little red riding hood, right? You know? And the wolf dresses up, right? Same picture here. They're a raving wolf, and they're wrapped up in sheep's clothing. And here's the thing. Listen, when the world opposes you, it would be so much easier if the world looked like the world and was ugly and terrible and vicious and vile. It would be so easy to go, oh, yeah, but it's typically not. The way the world works is what, what Satan will do is he'll... He'll have people to, to sit right beside of you in church. <laughs> they look like good people. They sing and they worship, supposedly. And they go through all the motions. And yet they can be like a raving wolf. Ready to pounce. Because that's the way the world wants to destroy us and our devotion to the Lord. And I want you to know today that we have got to put on an understanding and that we have to beware of the enemy and how he will try to attack us and take us down. And if it was somebody that was outside the camp, it would be different. But he doesn't. He often uses people that are real close to us. People that build relationships. People that, you know, there's a, I was reading a story. Where did I read that? Oh, it was about, somebody had something on Facebook and I read it. It's talking about uh, communism. It was talking about how that, uh, this person from another country said, do you know how to catch a pig? And they were asking a professor and the professor thought, oh, you know, this is just a, a joke. This is, you know, I'm just waiting for the punchline. No, I don't know how to catch pig. How do you catch pig? The guy was being serious. He said, he said, what you do is you go out in the open field and you throw a bunch of seed out and the wild pigs will come and they'll start eating the seed and all that. And then after they do that for several days or, or a week or so, then you go out and you build a fence on one side of the, of the, the food. And, and the pigs will be a little leery of it, but after a little while they'll realize ain't nothing going on. So they'll come and they'll start eating the grain again. They'll eat the grain, they'll eat it and do that again for a little while. Then they go out and build another fence uh, on another corner of it. And then the pigs, they, they are a little leery, but after a little while they see nothing's happening. So they'll go and they'll keep eating. And then another side of the fence. Until eventually they, they do all four sides with an open gate. And the pigs, once they feel comfortable, nothing's going to happen. They go into the fence and they just start eating the grain. And they eat the grain until finally you go and you shut the, the gate. And now they're trapped. And I want to tell you something. The enemy doesn't work any different than that. It'd be different if they came to fight you. And if they came ugly and mean, they typically come. And it's a gradual process of sucking you in to their world until finally... They're like that wolf that pounces. That's what happens. And we can all find ourselves in a place, if we're not careful, where we get sucked into that. And we have to know that the world is that way. And the world will try to destroy us. The world is the philosophy of the world rather than the philosophy of God's Word. We need to live according to the Word of God, not according to the philosophy of man. Men and women can have opinions, but their opinion should never take precedence over the Word of God. What does God say? We have to live that life that brings honor to Him in our devotion, to follow what God says to do. And so we find here in this passage, it says that there is raving wolves, verse 16, and will recognize them, and, we, and it talks about you will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes 
or figs from thistles? So every healthy, healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased, dis, diseased tree bears bad fruit. Hear me out for a minute. Here's how you know whether somebody is good, a good influence in your life. It's according to the good decisions they make. If they're making poor decisions and bad decisions, then understand that you should not allow them to influence your decision in your life. Because a good tree will bear good fruit. And if it's not bearing good fruit, then it's not being that good tree. And we need to understand that our life has got to be influenced by the things that bring honor to God and bring good fruit as God wants our life to bring good fruit. And we can't allow ourselves to be influenced by the thoughts of the world and the way the world thinks and the way the world carries on. But then I want you to also see, as I started to tell you a while ago, that's the world. Now I want to talk to you for just a minute about the flesh. We need to beware of the flesh. So this man, he's let down through the roof, and Jesus, he sees their faith, and he brings a healing to this man, and once he brings a healing to the man, what does he say to him? What does he tell him to do? You heard the story, right? What did he tell him to do? He's been laying in his bed. What did he tell him to do? He told him to get up and do what with the bed? Pick it up and walk. Go. <laughs> now hold on just a minute. Did you know you have an inner voice that talks to you all the time? I know I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, right? We have an inner voice that talks to us all the time. And I don't know about yours, but mine works overtime. I overthink everything. And that inner voice talks to me all the time. And there's so many times I got to tell it to shut up. And we can't allow ourselves to overthink things all the time and allow ourselves, because here's what's going to happen to this man who is a paralytic. Listen to me. He's been a paralytic for a really super long time. I don't know if he was born that way or what. I can't, I can't recall that part. I don't have it in this passage. There may be other passages that tell us. But here's this man who's a paralytic, and he's laying there, and he can't get up. And Jesus just told him to get up. You know what I can imagine went on in his, what could have went on in his mind humanly? You know how many times I've tried to get up? I've tried to get up. Don't tell me to get up. I can't get up. I've tried to get up. What are you trying to do, embarrass me? I'm going to try to get up and fall flat on my face. I can't do that. What do you mean, pastor, that God wants me to get up and give my testimony? I can't get up in front of people. I can't talk in front of people. I've never been able to talk in front of people. Don't ask me to do something I can't do. My friend, I want you to know something. When Jesus tells you to do something, He can do it in and through you every time. And what happened to this man? And he's laying on that bed. Jesus said, get up and take your bed. That man could have reasoned in his own mind. And the flesh could have taken over. And he could have said, I can't. My legs are weak. I've never been able to do it. And I can't do it now. But he didn't. The Bible says he immediately got up. And he did what God told him to do. And when God tells you to do something, you got to be careful of that self-talk that will talk you out of things every time. Whether it's getting baptized, whether it's getting up and telling your story and helping other people understand that God takes broken things and He uses them. See, the story of the leper shows us that God takes the most vile and broken and He's willing to use it. Now, I don't know what that does for you, but that does a lot for me because I know me. <laughs> and when I know me, then I'm going, well... Praise God, that means I've got hope. And I'm sure that you can think the same thing. But hear me out now, don't miss this. But if somebody else has a sin that's even worse than ours, how quick we are sometimes to look down our nose at somebody and go, oh, but wait a minute. Maybe me, but I don't know about them. I don't know about that. Once again, I go back to the shirts. Either it's a motto on a shirt, and if it's just a motto, we need to burn them and get rid of them. But if that's who we are, no perfect people allowed, then we ought to be open arms to all those that are willing to seek after Jesus. Amen. And to say, come. 
Whoever will. <laughs> whoever. I love that Jesus says. Whoever will. So let them come. Let them come. I don't care who they are. Let them come. If they want to seek Jesus, let them come. But that self-talk will play out in our head and we'll reason and we'll lean to our own understanding and we'll start excusing things and we'll start setting up barriers and setting up walls. And my friend, you've got to rebuke that in the name of Jesus and you've got to say, Jesus, give me your mind. Help me to see things the way you see them. Help me to love people the way that you love them. And God, protect my heart from allowing myself to be judgmental or to be bitter or to allow myself to be in a place where I am thinking somehow it's okay for for me that I am reached by Jesus and I'm loved by Jesus but not someone else here's a paralytic Jesus said get up take your bed and walk in Mark chapter 2 and verse 1 or excuse me in um, Matthew chapter 6 in Matthew chapter 6 and Verse number 1 and 2. Listen to what it says. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen of them. For then you will, know, you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. You know what it's saying? I, I, I take it right back to this whole area. Beware of the flesh. Beware of why you do what you do. Beware of setting yourself in a place that you think somehow you're in a better place than someone else. Somehow you have a place, a position to where you can look down on someone else. My friend, the foot of the cross is level for us all. I want you to know that none of us are better than anyone else. I was just asking the other group earlier in the, other, in the uh, first service. I asked this question. I said, what is the difference between a person who finds themselves in prison and you? You know what it is? Uh, you say, yeah, I know what it is. They're a wicked and evil person. No, it was one bad decision. You are but one bad decision decision of being found in the exact same place as someone who's in a terrible place in their life one bad choice all you gotta do is make one horribly bad choice get caught for it you're done we're a whole lot more alike than we want to than we want to think we are we all are potentially in a place of devastation and so what we have to do do you realize it and again, I, said, I was saying this in the first group. I, I don't want to miss saying this. Here's the thing. When it comes to, if, if, if it's only one bad decision away that makes a difference, there's only one person that can change our decisions, and that's Jesus. And that's why we need everybody to come to the feet of Jesus, no matter the decisions they made, because there's only one thing that's going to change the trajectory of their life moving forward, and that's a change of decision, and only Jesus can make those changes. And so we've got to be a people ready to help and be positioned in order that we're able to help people find that place of peace and rest that's found in the Lord and in Him alone. So in Mark chapter 2, we find this man. We find uh, that there's a warning that I'm giving you as we look at this picture. Beware of the world. Beware of the flesh. And now I want you to see beware of the devil. What does that look like, Pastor? How does that relate in this story? Well, the devil is spiritual. Would you agree with me? He's a spirit being. He works on a spiritual level. He's a spiritual being, except it's not a good spirit. It's a bad spirit. And so we find in this passage that in verse number 6, after Jesus said, Son, your sins are forgiven, in verse 5, verse 6 says, in Mark chapter 2, verse 6, now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their heart, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they were thus questioning within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your heart? The spiritual leaders of that day 
the spiritual leaders brought opposition against the devotion of these men. Satan will find his way to, to inject, to destroy, and to defeat us in our devotion to God. And if we are not aware of the warnings that are in front of us, the world, the flesh, and the devil, then we are doomed to fail and to fall in our devotion to the Lord. But if we want to stay true in our devotion to the Lord, to do what God's called us to do individually, as well as collectively as a church, then we have to adhere to the warnings that are in front of us and be aware of them and know that they're going to happen. It's not a matter of if they happen. It's a matter of when they happen. And what are we going to do to be prepared to, to counter that in our own walk with the Lord? Do you believe that God, all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to them that are called according to His purpose? Do you believe that? Do you believe that God ever makes a mistake? Does God ever make a mistake? No. Do you believe God united us together as a church family by mistake? you think that was an accident? Or you think that was His design? So we need to be devoted to what God's called us to. We need to be devoted in such a way that we're not going to allow the world, the flesh, or the devil to, to do anything to influence our ability to stay true and devoted no matter what anybody else thinks, to do what God has called us to do. And that's the work of the ministry, of bringing the worst of the worst to the feet of Jesus that their lives can be changed and to produce disciples, followers of Jesus. Every head by and every eye closed this morning.